Hello, everybody, and welcome to the European Respiratory Society Guidelines in Focus video interview. It's a regular feature of the ERS Respiratory Channel. And the topic of this interview is a recently published statement of the ERS on benign pleural effusions. And according to ERS rules, a statement does not contain any recommendations for clinical practice. So that's very important to realize. My name is Peter Gumena, and I will be leading the discussion today. And I'm a doctor of respiratory medicine at St. Nicholas Hospital's Vitas in Belgium. And I'm the scientific chair and board member of the Embark Bronchiectasis Clinical Research Collaboration. And my main expertise is in respiratory infections, but I'm also a member of the guidelines working group and of the ERS Clinical Practice Guidelines Methodology Network. Joining me today in the discussion is Dr. Anand Sundaralingam, and he is a doctor of respiratory medicine and MD student at the Oxford Neural Unit, and he is the early career chair of the published statement. Welcome, Anand. Could you please tell us, Anand, what made you decide on the subject of the statement? Sure. Thank you for that introduction, Peter. So that's a great question. Um, there are a few reasons why we turned our attention to this topic. Uh, now, we've achieved a lot in recent years in advancing the field of plural medicine with several landmark multi-center international studies, and we should be proud of that. As a result, we have several reputable clinical practice guidelines for managing a number of these uh, conditions. The 2023 BTS plural guidelines come to mind, as do the very recent ERS uh, clinical practice guidelines on pneumothorax and the recent statement on plural infection. These have all really helped to shift the dial and improve the quality of care we can offer our patients. However, we do have compelling evidence that non-malignant pleural effusion actually have a greater burden of disease in terms of sheer incidence, costs to healthcare systems, and of course the personal impact on patients with morbidity and mortality reaching and sometimes exceeding that of malignant pleural effusions in certain groups. So despite this significant impact, we have very little consensus on best practice and guidelines to date have generally avoided this subgroup of patients. And we can understand why. There's very few high quality studies to base guidance upon. We felt it was incumbent upon us to try and address this. And the starting point was a statement where we summarize the evidence in a systematic fashion, provide examples of how expert task force members practice and importantly, highlight areas for future research, because that's really the only way we're going to see the next generation of plural studies address these important topics. Yeah, this sounds like a quite difficult task, Anand. You mean you're covering quite a variety of different topics here. So what did you end up selecting and how did you make that decision? Yeah, you're correct. It was a challenge um, because, of course, non-malignant plural effusions cover a constellation of different clinical entities. We had to narrow our focus in order to do each topic justice. The ERS had already produced a recent statement on plural infection. And so we were able to focus our attentions on what we felt to be the remaining major drivers of non-malignant plural effusions. So this is namely cardiac failure, hepatic hydrothorax, end-stage renal failure, benign asbestos-related pleural effusions, post-surgical pleural effusions, non-specific pleuritis, and a section on the overall diagnostic approach to non-malignant pleural effusions. Now, we recognize that this is not an exhaustive list, but felt these were clinically important subject areas to not miss, and these were the areas that experts were telling us needed addressing. It was also important to recognize that these patients often have their care spread across a number of different clinical services by the very nature of their condition. Uh, and it was important for the statement to reflect a multidisciplinary endeavor. And so you'll see we have uh, cardiology, hepatology, nephrology, pathology, and surgical experts, in addition to leading public experts um, uh, from across the world who contributed to this statement. Fantastic, fantastic introduction. And um, can you make maybe take us through the highlights of that first chapter? You know, the, the overall diagnostic approach? Yes, of course. Um, so it was really important for us to tackle the diagnostic approach to non-malignant pleural effusions as our starting point. We know that there are close to 60 reported causes of pleural effusion in the medical literature, and therefore it's going to be next to impossible for any single test to give you the answer in the majority of cases. 
As clinicians, we all appreciate it is the combination of robust history, examination, investigation, and sometimes even trials of therapy before we can satisfactorily reach a diagnosis. With that in mind, we delve into the intricacies of characterizing pleural effusions based on biochemistry. Now, Light's criteria has stood the test of time, and it remains the most widely used classification system. However, we must remember that the late great Richard Light calibrated his thresholds so as not to miss even a single case of exudate. And as the consequences of missing cancer or empyema can be catastrophic. As a result, 25% of effusions of transudative etiology will get misclassified as exudate, and that's important not to forget. The serum to pleural effusion albumin gradient helps reclassify effusions correctly in heart failure. And similarly, the pleural fluid to serum albumin ratio can help in hepatic hydrothorax. Other tests that are helpful in heart failure are the serum or pleural fluid natriuretic peptides. There's often a lot of interest and excitement around using radiology to diagnose the etiology of effusions, or at least separate them into transudative and exudative categories. And I'm afraid the evidence would suggest that radiological findings alone can't differentiate between plural effusions. However, there may be a role for combined scoring systems that include clinical, biochemical and radiological information. And we cover one such model for heart failure in our statement. And this is certainly an area worthy of more work. Really, really informative, Fanant. Um, I, I saw that the next statement, statement, you then move on to heart failure. Could you maybe summarize what we can learn from this chapter? Yes, of course. So with heart failure, we wanted to study two key questions, management options for refractory heart failure related effusions and investigations for a unilateral effusion in a patient with known heart failure, which is a common clinical conundrum for us. Surprisingly enough, it was challenging to even identify a definition for refractory pleural effusions in the medical literature. And the task force experts settled on persistent effusions despite maximal tolerated doses of diuretics as their definition. Numerous pleural interventions to address heart failure related pleural effusions have been described in the literature, and many of them do offer effective palliation of symptoms. However, we identified only a single RCT, the REDUCE trial that compared IPCs to repeated thoracocentesis, which showed no advantage in dyspnea relief in IPCs and a greater adverse event rate. But several retrospective studies do show that IPCs do effectively palliate symptoms and may be beneficial in those patients who have required three or more thoracocentesis. Whilst there are a number of studies that have assessed the accuracy of natriuretic peptides or bedside ultrasound in diagnosing heart failure in unselected populations presenting with unilateral effusions, there were none studying unilateral effusions in patients with known established heart failure. And this remains an area worthy of further research. The task force members' own practice is to ensure a reasonable balance between the risk of missing a non-cardiac cause in these patients against the risk of an invasive diagnostic procedure. And this is summarized in figure three. I noticed that following that is something you also just mentioned, which is hepatic hydrothorax. What does the chapter on the hepatic hydrothorax uh, cover? Um, so here, our primary area of interest was the therapeutic options for, these, for those patients with symptomatic refractory hepatic hydrothorax. And again, we struggled to identify the definition of refractory in the majority of the studies we reviewed. Liver transplantation is the only curative treatment for hepatic hydrothorax, and the task force members would refer all patients who are eligible for this intervention following the index presentation of a patient with hepatic hydrothorax. TIPS, or transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt, does improve hepatic hydrothorax in about 50% of cases, but the mortality of this procedure is high, and there are other downstream consequences of this procedure for patients. TIPS has been used by the authors as a bridge to control effusions whilst patients are awaiting transplantation. Therapeutic thoracocentesis is effective at providing relief of symptoms and quite safe. IPCs, whilst effective, do have a greater complication rate in this particular population. The task force members would prioritize its use as a palliative measure rather than 
or patients who are awaiting a transplant. Areas worthy of further research include identifying the specific risk factors uh, within the hepatic hydrothorax population that predispose them to heightened infection or bleeding risk, as well as studying optimal treatment strategies. Really informative, Anand. Now you've addressed the liver, you've addressed influence of the heart or heart failure and pleural effusions. There's also the kidneys that you talk about. Could you tell us a little bit about your end-stage renal failure chapter? Uh, yes, of course. Um, so this is a really understudied population, but arguably also the smallest of the three main organ failure groups that we get involved with for pleural interventions. The majority of these patients, when referred for pleural interventions, are likely to be on a palliative pathway, as many will have already presented to services having not tolerated renal replacement, or they were deemed not fit enough for renal replacement therapies. In contrast, plural interventions have been shown to be quite safe in this population. Serial thoracocentesis is the initial approach adopted by task force members, with IPCs reserved for those with particularly refractive or symptomatic cases. Um, there are a number of etiologies implicated in plural effusions in the end-stage renal failure population, but the commonest will be fluid overload. This population can be at particular risk from malignancy or infection, uh, particularly if they're immunosuppressed, for, you know, for example, following renal transplant. We also specifically looked at the approach to a patient with peritoneal dialysis associated pleuroperitoneal leak. The evidence supporting best practice is entirely based on observational series and we outline an approach in figure six. One of the key things to remember is the ability to pause and resume peritoneal dialysis whilst observing for recurrence as a core diagnostic tool in this population. And this is a pretty unique tool to have in plural medicine. And the next statement, you move away from the three, the three involved organs, you know, the kidney, the heart, and the liver, and you go to talk about the benign asbestos-related plural effusions alongside the NSE, NSP chapter. Could you maybe elucidate more on, on that chapter? Yeah, of course. I mean, I think the two are quite complementary, so it's quite useful. Um, I think it is um, helpful to talk about them together here. So benign asbestos-related pleural effusions, or BAPE for short, and diffuse pleural thickening are both manifestations of inflammatory driven responses to exposure, often quite historical, to asbestos fibres. Sometimes history and radiological findings are sufficient in diagnosing these patients, and there are recommended radiological criteria for the diagnosis of diffuse pleural thickening. But these patients often require biopsies due to a heightened concern for malignant pleural mesothelioma. Cases of BAPE, however, will yield a histological finding of non-specific pleuritis. This also goes by several other terms, benign pleuritis, fibrinous pleuritis, or simply just fibrosis and inflammation. So this is a very challenging histological finding to deal with as pleural physicians. We know that in case series of plural biopsies, up to 40% of cases have shown this finding. As its name implies, it doesn't denote a specific diagnosis. Instead, any known cause of plural inflammation may result in this histological finding. Despite thoracoscopic plural biopsy being the gold standard test for diagnosis of malignancy, an NSP finding carries with it a false negative rate of about 8%. It is unclear if this is a true false negative at the time of biopsy, or if instead a malignancy, most often malignant pleural mesothelioma, eventually develops, and it was in fact not or non-diagnosable at the time of biopsy. The advent of advanced ancillary histocytological techniques, such as fluorescence in situ hybridization to detect CDKN2A deletion, and or immunohistochemistry to detect BAP1 or MTAP loss are helpful in differentiating between non-specific pleuritis or BAPE and mesothelioma in situ. Uh, but importantly, the clinician must be confident that satisfactory and adequate biopsies were conducted. And if you're in doubt, address this. Most cases of eventual diagnoses will present themselves within one year. However, malignant pleural mesothelioma can take longer, approximately within the two-year time frame. So it is the adopted practice of task force members to conduct CT sur surveillance between one to two years. As you can imagine, given the great deal of uncertainty in this area, there's enormous potential for further research, particularly around biomarkers, risk stratification, and imaging and biopsy techniques.
Thank you for this really concise and interesting summary of that chapter, because we're now moving on to the, to the final part, which is also a really interesting chapter on post-surgical pleural effusions, Anand. Uh, could you maybe give us some pointers on what we have to take home from that chapter? Of course. Um, so this is also a common scenario in which pleural and respiratory physicians are asked for their input, particularly as ultrasound-guided thoracocentesis has done away with the need for more invasive surgical tube thoracostomy, even in post-op patients. Whilst pleural effusions post-operatively are common, um, there is little to suggest they impact morbidity or mortality. Um, presentation varies according to the underlying diagnosis and type of surgery, for example, cardiac surgery versus thoracic surgery. A majority of these effusions do not require intervention and radiological findings do not predict outcome. Most of the literature in post-operative effusions has more, more or less focused on the timing of post-operative grain removal, uh, and there is strong evidence to support earlier removal at greater grain outputs than traditionally accepted. Late post-operative effusions, they remain a poorly understood condition and is usually a diagnosis of exclusion and further work is required in defining this clinical entity. Yeah, I, exactly. I think so as well. And so my, my final question would be, how will you use these statements to change practice and improve the outcome of the patient? Of course. Um, so I think it's important to remember this is a statement that summarizes the evidence to date and shares how expert task force members practice, but these are not recommendations for practice, as would be the case with a clinical practice guideline. However, we feel that even just highlighting and summarizing the evidence allows us to take a leap forwards in standardizing how clinicians are managing these patients, given the vast heterogeneity in current practice. And minimizing this variation in practice is important for improving patient outcomes. Other important themes that emerged from our statement was the absolutely essential need to work collaboratively with the relevant specialties to provide optimum care for patients. And that in many instances, this may include palliative care specialists, given the significant life-limiting conditions many of these patients have. Finally, the paucity of high-quality evidence was stark, and we identified a number of areas worthy of further research. If in a few years' time we have this evidence and are much better informed in managing these patients, and this renders this current statement obsolete, that would make me very happy indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Anand, for this really concise and informative overview of these statements. And thank you for sharing your expertise with us. And I thank the listeners for joining our interview. Thank you very much.